In this lecture, I want to introduce the basic structure of a MOSFET. So at this point, it's expected that you are familiar with the circuit operation of a MOSFET, though you know nothing about how it is constructed. So here's an NMOS, an N-channel MOSFET. We'll call it an NMOS or an NFET. And it has a gate, and it has a drain, it has a source. And we'll define this current IDS as the current going from the drain to source. And we have uh, stated so far that the current going into the gate of the MOSFET is zero because uh, basically there is, um, there's no DC path between the gate and the rest of the MOSFET. We'll get some insight now when we look at the physical structure as to how, how that actually comes about. So in lab you've used uh, the uh, 2N7000. I'm trying to draw a package here for it. It's a, a TO, it's called a TO92 package. And I believe this is the source and the gate and the drain. Okay, now this is in an epoxy shell. So there's a 2N7000. If you were to decapsulate this, you would see that you have a little silicon wafer silicon wafer silicon chip all right and you have your three uh, leads coming off here these are the physical leads that you would see and there'll be little bond wires that actually very very thin wires that essentially connect these big fat leads that are uh, more convenient for us as uh, users and uh, given this is a leaded part we're going to plug it into uh, through hole circuit board or to the a solderless breadboard, but uh, to make the connection to this little uh, this little uh, silicon wafer, we uh, or chip we have to have these little thin bond wires that are actually ultrasonically welded. So uh, this part and the size of this chip may be on the order of I don't know a millimeter on a side. It's quite small for this little two n seven thousand. This is a sixty volt. N channel, so N FET. It has, if I recall, uh, IDS continuous uh, somewhere around 200 milliamps, I think. It has an RDS on resistance of somewhere around 2 to 5 ohms. And yeah, so uh, that's the type of, oh, it has a power, max power dissipation of less than 500 milliwatts. Okay, that's assuming that you're at uh, room temperature. So the ambient temperature would be uh, 25 degrees. I think that's correct. <clears throat> All right, so now if I were to zoom in on this wafer and look at a cross section of it. Okay, so this is a cross section of um, cross section of the of the silicon wafer. Okay. This is at least a representative construction of it. So let me draw this a little further. Okay, there are, and this is a simplified view, okay? There's, there's actually a little more to this than what I'm going to draw, but it'll suffice for our explanation. I'll call this N, or actually N plus, N plus, and then down here I'm going to call this P. All right, there's some metallization up on the top here, and these are the leads. This will be the source. This will be the drain. I'll explain what I'm drawing here in a moment, okay? This is the gate. Okay, so this right here is the silicon wafer. All right, now silicon, let me say a little bit about silicon atoms. Silicon SI has four valence electrons. Okay, and when it forms uh, a lattice structure, a crystal, okay, crystalline structure, you can think of the, uh, if I have a s silicon atom here, another silicon atom, <clears throat> there will be, let me draw a couple of these,
these are representing the the bonds between these atoms. Let me put a couple more around this guy right here. Okay, so this guy here, notice he's got one, two, three, four electrons that are in covalent bonds uh, with adjacent silicon atoms. And a silicon by itself is a semiconductor. I mean, when it's in its pure form, it's a semiconductor. It does not conduct electricity uh, very well at all. It's uh, far better than glass, but it is not useful as a conductor. So we actually have to do some modifications to pure silicon uh, to make it useful, and that's where these, uh, these, this nomenclature of N and P come from. So if you take a, uh, an atom like phosphor, phosphorus, and you okay, and and you actually um, contaminate the silicon crystal with a small amount of phosphorus, then uh, you can actually change the properties of the silicon uh, crystal. So the wafer itself, silicon wafer, is made of pure uh, silicon uh, crystals. But then, in certain areas, you will actually what we call dope. You will dope the silicon with either a uh, an n-type uh, atom, which would be phosphor, or a p-type atom, which might be boron. So phosphor has five valence electrons, and boron has three valence electrons. Okay, and so what happens is if you have, let me draw a, a lattice here, Okay, if all of these are silicon, but this guy here is phosphorus, okay, okay, we will have between each of these atoms, oops, we will have two covalent bonds. Okay, now for phosphor, what's going to be different is that it has a fifth electron. Okay, so I'm just kind of filling this out here. But Foster will have actually an extra one right here. So this will be an extra, extra valence electron. And that extra valence electron does not join into covalent bonds with the silicon. And so it's free, so to speak. It's not quite free, but it's pretty easy for it to jump up to a conduction band which and where it could travel throughout this this uh, now contaminated uh, or doped uh, crystal uh, silicon crystal lattice okay so we call this an n type uh, doping or n type sil uh, semiconductor n type semiconductor okay now we could similarly let me add a few more uh, atoms here. So let's say this is silicon again, except let's say this right here is boron. All right? Boron has just three valence electrons. And so what we'd have is there would be a hole right here where there would be a vacancy. Uh, the silicon atom right here uh, would have a, its electron would not be bound up, um, I'm sorry, it would be in a covalent bond, but there would be room for one more covalent bond. Um, and so there's a hole where if a, an electron wanders in that area, it could fill that spot. All right, now what can happen is you can have an electron next, uh, next to this boron atom that moves over say from a silicon atom adjacent to it, moves over and drops into that hole, leaving a hole from where it left. Okay, And then that process can be repeated, whereby you get this appearance that 
there are there's a hole, a type of charge called a hole that is moving about in the structure. What's really happening is that there's a vacancy. It's kind of like a vacant spot in a parking lot, and uh, one car pulls out of its spot and moves over to the vacant spot, leaving a vacancy behind it. Now another car can move into that vacant spot, leaving a vacancy behind. So you have a hole or a vacant spot that is moving around. In the end, the only thing that's moving really are cars, right? The electrons are moving. But you can think of it equivalently as actually having this parking spot that's moving, right? The parking spot is actually moving. That's what we call a hole. And it actually is a, we think of it as a positive charge because it's a deficit of having an electron. Now the thing to, to clarify here is if you, if you look at this structure, uh, this lattice that has all silicon but now let's say a phosphor atom in there, adding a phosphor atom and ignoring the boron for a moment does not actually add or change the charge neutrality of the structure, right? The phosphor is charge neutral because it has five uh, it would have five protons as well as having, or it would have corresponding five protons that would correspond to the five valence electrons. So it's charge neutral and the silicon is charge neutral. So we have to be careful when we say that there's an extra valence electron, like we say right here, that doesn't mean that the, there's a net negative charge to the structure. It is a net neutral charge. But that electron can be easily stolen from the phosphor and be put to use for uh, using this crystal lattice now as a conductor. Similarly, when we put a boron atom in an otherwise pure silicon uh, structure, we haven't disturbed the charge neutrality of the structure. The boron has an equal number of electrons and, and protons, so it's charge neutral. When you add it in, it, even though it uh, results in a hole, there's not a net positive charge. However, it, there is a vacancy that will uh, allow a, an electron to come in and occupy that very readily. Okay, and now when you think of wherever that electron came from, okay, to fill that hole, it leaves a vacancy behind it, and that vacancy actually can now produce a, a, a net positive charge, okay? So now you can think of actually it's like this positive charge is moving throughout your structure. So think of the n-type semiconductors as be, being conductors of electrons, and think of the p-type semiconductor as being conduct, conductors excuse me, conductors of positive charges. But remember the parking lot car analogy. There are only electrons moving, okay? But it, it seems like there is, there are positive charges or there's the parking spot is actually moving. All right, so now how does this help us in creating a MOSFET? Well, there's a lot more that really should be said about the, um, you know, what happens when you put a, a, a n-type semiconductor and a p-type semiconductor together, and that would be a whole other lecture or two, and I, I don't want to get into that now, and I think I can explain the basic uh, structure or behavior of MOSFET without doing that, but I do have to tell you a little bit about how a, uh, a diode is constructed. To really understand the physics of semiconductors, you really start with, the, with what's called a p-n junction. Okay, a p-n junction is where you have an n-type semiconductor and then you have a p-type semiconductor and you put them together okay that's actually how you construct the diode and the diode is oriented in this way so it goes current will flow from the p-type semiconductor to the n-type semiconductor so I wish I could explain why it is that uh, electrons or positive charges if you will can flow from a p to n-type through that junction and why positive charge can't flow from the n-type to the p-type. And that's what I really would need another lecture or two to explain. But if you would just accept that at this point, that um, current is only allowed to flow from the p to the n-type and not vice versa, then I can proceed with explaining how a MOSFET works. So um, notice that I'm going to go back up to this drawing now, the physical structure of the MOSFET. Notice I've labeled three nodes, the source, the gate, and the drain. Now actually there's a fourth, um, there's a fourth uh, terminal on a MOSFET, and it's called the substrate. So I'm going to draw that down here because that's where it, that's where it uh, is physically. And you could call that, we'll call it B because it's the, um, a lot of times it's referred to as the bulk 
um, substrate. Okay, it's what the transistor is built on. All right, so all of this material right now is, uh, or the, the bulk of this is all P material. Now, if I had a line shown right here, that's there's no line right here. That's a that's a mistake. So this is all solid material. It's all P, but there are these two N plus wells. Okay. The plus means simply that not only is it N material, but we've actually put a whole lot of phosphor into or uh, phosphorus into this uh, these wells to make uh, those wells have a lot of extra uh, electrons available for conduction. Okay. Now this structure is completely symmetrical. In other words, the, there is no distinction between the drain and, and the source at this point. Um, the reason that there is a distinction ultimately when you actually construct a circuit with a MOSFET, uh, the reason there is a, they're not fully symmetric source and drain is because uh, the source, the bulk gets connected to one of the terminals. Okay, so let me draw the MOSFET here first again. And this is what we have. This, oops, here's the gate, here's the drain, here's the source, or actually you could flip the drain and source at this point. This right here is the bulk. Okay, that's the bulk. Now when you physically tie that down here, you're now saying this becomes a source. So what we do is we physically will tie this up to the source. If we had tied it physically over to the right side, then the drain that I have labeled here would actually be the source, and the source on the left would be the drain. Okay. Now what we want to do is spot, uh, if we can, uh, spot any p-n junctions. All right. Now if you just accept this that a p-n junction forms a diode, then between the bulk and the drain, there's going to be a diode. So I'm going to actually draw a diode like this. Okay. What that means is the diode is not floating out here in the P material, but it's actually at the interface where the N and the P material actually um, interface with one another. Similarly, there's a diode over here between the, P, the uh, bulk and the source. However, because the bulk and the source are literally tied together, this actually becomes a short. Okay, It's shorted, so there's no point in even drawing the diode there. All right, so now if we... Uh, if we would draw that diode in our circuit, let me go over here and redraw the MOSFET. Now I'm going to put a physical diode outside of the, the, the uh, MOSFET structure just so you can see how it actually is wired in. It is pointing from the bulk, which is tied to the source, to the drain. So it's actually going, it's going between here. I'll draw it down to the, to the source because they're tied together, right? But the diode is pointing this way. Okay? And there is literally a diode. If you were to connect the drain and source backwards, or if you took like a multimeter that does a diode tester, and you put the red lead on the source and the black lead on the drain, and you had the gate to source shorted, in other words, the transistor is supposed to be off, your uh, diode meter would actually beep and, and show you a forward voltage of that diode. There is really a diode uh, there. Okay. So how do we actually, so, so here's the question, how do we get current to flow? Let's say that I put a voltage across the drain to source. So here I'm going to attach a voltage or apply a voltage, VDS, all right? How do I get current to flow from the drain to the source? Now if you look at the structure, uh, to get from the drain to the source, it has to go through the bulk, right, this P material. And, in fact, if it gets to the P material, then it can actually j jump through this short over here and get right over to the source. But for it to get from the drain to the substrate through the P material, it has to go through this diode. And the diode is pointing the wrong way, right? It's pointing from source to drain. So when you apply a positive VDS, you're actually reverse biasing that diode. And there's no current that's going to flow. Now, again, I haven't explained why that doesn't happen. But if you just accept that a PN junction does not allow uh, current to flow from the P to the N junction, I'm sorry, from the uh, from the N to the P junction. I don't know if I said that backwards. Or the, so you, you can't have positive charge flowing from the N to the P. 
so if you accept that, then we have a problem here, or actually it's, it's a good problem at this point. The MOSFET does not conduct any current uh, in its basic state, right? We have to actually do something to get it to conduct, and we call that enhancing. We have to enhance the MOSFET, and then specifically we're going to say that we're going to enhance uh, the MOSFET channel, okay? So in this area uh, right here is a channel, what we'll call a channel. Now it's not a physic it's not physically distinct from the the bulk it's what's going to form in that region based on what we do at the gate that will ultimately create a virtual channel okay not a real not a, not a permanent channel but one that will be uh, basically produced in in response to applying a voltage to the gate all right so how does this work the gate i've drawn off some distance away from the uh, the bulk okay and i'm going to put in a hash you know hash uh, texture in here and this is silicon oxide silicon oxide it's an insulator all right it's an insulator so <clears throat> between the gate and the substrate the bulk material there is an insulator this gate up here this would be some metallization that you'd have or now they use some kind of polysilicon, but think of it as a metallization, right? Just a metal contact. It cannot make direct electrical contact with the substrate, but there is this insulator between it and the substrate to make sure that there is no uh, current flow through it, all right? Now, if you apply a positive voltage between the gate and the source, okay, this is going to be our VGS, you start applying a voltage. What happens is we can think of positive charges accumulating on this plate. Now, of course, we know there's no positive charge. It's, it's an absence of, of electrons. You know, electrons flow the other way, and now you have um, the underlying positive charge in the fixed metal structure, and that leads to a positive, uh, a net positive charge. But as you apply a positive voltage here, we, what's going to happen is because of this, this is really like a capacitor, and you have lots of um, you have a lot of electrons that are available in the two wells, the source well and the drain well, right? And electrons can flow from the N to the P material, all right? So electrons can flow. Let me go down here. Electrons can flow from the N to P material, just like you know positive charges can flow from the P to N material, right? So, so there, we can have electrons that flow out from the N material, both the drain and the source, and they flow into the P material area, okay? And they line up as close as they can, right? They're drawn up toward that gate, but they can't go any further because of the, ox the silicon oxide insulator layer. So you're really charging a capacitor. All right. Now, as you add electrons into the P material, think about what I said about the P material. The P material is uh, silicon crystal structure where there has been some boron impurities that have been added. The boron impurities, the boron atoms, have only three valence electrons. And so there is a hole uh, next to each boron, a hole for, in the, for, for holding an electron. All right. So what happens is when these electrons come into this area, they drop down into these holes and they fill up the holes. Okay. And now you have all of the valence uh, electrons or all the valence shell layer, if you will, energy layer, is all full. All right. There are no more holes. And if you continue to add more gate voltage relative to the source, you will be adding more positive charges to the gate and consequently drawing more negative charges into this, what we'll call this channel. And eventually, once all of the holes are filled, if you draw in more, uh, more electrons, you actually have what's called an inversion layer. You actually have uh, this situation where the P material ends up flipping to what appears to be an N material. Now, how would that happen? Remember, the N material is one where you've placed some phosphorus atoms, and they are pentavalent. 
So they have an extra electron, remember right here, they have an elect extra electron that is easily uh, commandeered for supporting conduction through that, through that material. So now what we, what we do is if we flood the P material with electrons, filling up all the holes due to the boron, and now we add even more electrons, the additional electrons are going to behave like that extra phosphor electron. They'll be sitting up there with no one to bond with, and so they'll be very free to move about. And once that happens, now we actually have what's called a channel. Uh, it's uh, an induced channel that will actually form between the source and the drain. So let me redraw this now um, to show what that looks like. Okay, so here's N plus, N plus. This is the source. This is the drain. And now what I'm going to... Let me... Uh, okay, here's the gate. Got our voltage between gate and source, VGS. Okay. And what will happen is we'll actually get this... Mm, let me see how we draw this. Yeah, we'll get a channel that will actually form. Well, initially it's going to be a channel that's going to form uniformly across this. Okay, let's assume this terrain is grounded for right now. Okay, so this right here is going to be the induced, sorry, I boogered that drawing, induced channel. And you can guess that when we talk about the threshold voltage of the, um, uh, for the MOSFET, that is connected with this, with the the physical, um, uh, physical. Uh, uh, what's the word? Process. That's what I'm thinking. The physical process of um, the physical process of all of the holes due to the boron atoms in the, in the P material being filled with electrons. So you have to fill all the boron, all the holes from the boron first before the channel can start conducting. So that's tied to having, to, 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 that's tied to that threshold voltage, right? So that threshold voltage must have to do, must have to do with being able to attract enough electrons into the, uh, this channel to fill all the borons, or to establish at least the thinnest possible uh, channel uh, between the source and, and drain. And in fact, what will happen is, I should redraw this here, where you'll have the two wells, and initially you'll have a very, very thin channel. All right? But then you could... So if we have a... Call this... This is V... So maybe this is V threshold plus uh, 10 millivolts, okay? And if you put in now a voltage of V threshold plus, you know, I don't know, 100 millivolts, okay, the channel is deeper, right? So channel, channel depth increases with larger VGS, okay? Now all of this is still under the assumption, the assumption that the drain voltage is at zero, okay? Now the depth of the channel is going to be a function of uh, the differential voltage between the gate, okay, the gate and the, the substrate at that point, all right? So if we have both the source, and I should have done this, I should have grounded all these the source as well. If the source is grounded and the drain is grounded, okay, then the drain and source are at the same potential. And so we, we expect a uniform channel across, a uniform depth across the whole channel. Now consider the case where we had, here's our source and drain. We'll say this is grounded here. Put a voltage, VGS voltage, uh, between our source and gate. And now let's say that VGS is actually at VDS, I'm sorry, VDS is maybe equal to, I don't know, 
200 millivolts. Okay, 200 millivolts. And maybe their gate to source voltage is 2.5 volts. Okay, so I don't know, maybe the channel, originally maybe the channel was uniformly straight across this thick. Right? So down at this end here, the voltage in this region here, V diff, if you want to call it, is equal to uh, VG minus V of the source. That's just equal to the VGS, or 2.5 volts. Right? Up here, the V diff here, up at the drain, is a little bit different. It's going to be equal to VG minus VD, which is going to be equal to 2.3 volts. Okay, a little bit less. So what happens is you no longer have a uniform channel. It'll actually be tapered a little bit. Right? The depth of the channel is related to the voltage between the gate and the channel or the substrate at that point. And so you actually get this, um, this tipping. All right? So the reason I bring this in is because I want to show you how you arrive at the triode region or the saturation region. Right now, all of this is triode. So all of, so far, all of this is triode region. Okay. But as we increase the VDS, remember the condition for saturation or is that the drain to source voltage, so let's remember the saturation is when VDS is greater than VGS minus V threshold. Okay, so let's, I want to show you physically what is happening. Let's actually uh, consider that situation right now. Okay, so let's draw the, our structure one more time. Source is grounded. The drain up here is, now we're going to say this is uh, VDS. We'll put some numbers to this. We'll say the, th uh, let's see. Uh, this will be equal to VGS. We'll say VGS is 2.5. VGS minus V threshold. So this is 2.5, and let's assume that V threshold is 2.0. Okay, so this is 0.5 volts. And here's our channel, I mean our gate. Oops. We'll say this is 2.5 volts. And V threshold is 2.0 volts. All right, so down at source drain, down at this end here, we have 2.5 minus 0 volts, okay, equal to 2.5. Up here, we have 2.5 minus 0.5 volts, all right, equal to 2.0, which is no mistake that it is actually equal to V threshold. Okay. So now, what does the channel look like? The channel down at this end will be whatever it is for being 2.5 volts, so it has some depth to it. But when you get to the drain side, if you have just V threshold between the gate right here and the drain, or the substrate right at the boundary of the drain, now you have just enough potential to produce just enough electric field to draw just enough electrons into the P substrate to fill the boron holes. Okay? But not enough electrons in that region to produce any channel. So you're right at the cusp. You're right on that boundary. And what will happen is if you go further, where uh, if we now say VDS is greater than VGS minus V threshold, then this is what the channel looks like. Make it a little deeper here. It actually does not, it, 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 the, the term that's used is, is that it gets pinched off. Okay? It actually gets a little bit shorter. Maybe I drew that too. It's a small, it's a, sm, it's a small distance, but it actually gets pinched off. And it would, this is, this is, uh, you know, a little confusing because you would think, oh, that means that it's like you've opened up the circuit and no current can flow. Well, that's not exactly what will happen. Current can actually still flow through there because uh, there is a strong electric field between the drain and the source. And um, that strong electric field 
will actually sweep any electrons that uh, show up in that or approach that uh, that pinched off region they'll get close to that and then they'll feel the electric field and the electric field will sweep them across that voltage differential and it turns out that much of the voltage basically all of the voltage that you put across the drain to source say you put 60 volts or 50 volts between drain to source all but like the V threshold amount, so out of the 60 volts, 58 of the volts actually are going to be distributed right across this, this small region. So you could have 58 volts here, and then you could have uh, the 2 volts or so for the, uh, you know, between, um, across the rest of that channel. Okay, so let me finish drawing this here. VGS, so it's 2.5 volts still. So here's the channel, the inverted channel, but it is pinched off. And when that happens, uh, it turns out that uh, the transistor behaves like a current source. Okay, uh, adding actually more voltage across the drain to source does not cause any more voltage uh, to flow. All right, and the the current that actually ends up flowing is due uh, primarily to the voltage that is distributed across this channel region, and that's controlled just by the gate to source voltage. And so that's where you get this square law of if you you know double the gate to source voltage, you'll quadruple the amount of current that flows from the drain to source. But it is not a function of the drain to source voltage. So this is the saturation mode. Um, just incidentally, one, if you look at real data diode or real curves for MOSFETs, uh, so here's VDS, here is IDS. All right, so we'd have a different, we have family of curves. Remember this, here's this boundary for different VGSs. So this might be VGS1, this is VGS2, which is greater than VGS1, etc. Okay. Uh, our models that we use would say that in the saturation region, which is uh, out here, sat region, triode region is right here, triode. In the saturation region, the current is constant for a given VGS independent of VDS. Now, a real MOSFET, you'll see that it has a slight taper to it. Okay, slight taper. And the reason for that taper is that there is a what's called um, a channel length modulation. Channel length modulation. And what that is, is that as you increase the drain to source voltage over here, this pinched off region, that little gap there where the channel is now vanished, actually does lengthen just a little bit as you put higher voltage. And so because of that, the actual induced channel, which is the triangle wedge on the left, gets a little bit shorter. And um, that will actually produce, re result in a little bit more current flowing. And so any real diode curve will actually have some non-zero slope in the saturation region. Oftentimes we don't have to include that, um, but there's an easy way to actually include it in our model if we want to. I won't go into that right now, but it's basically a resistance. You can add a resistance across the drain to source to, uh, uh, to represent that. Okay, so I think I've uh, covered at least the basics of how a MOSFET operates. And hopefully, though you don't know semiconductor physics, uh, I've given you enough to actually get some appreciation for how... Um, how the physics surrounding a MOSFET actually result in the circuit behavior of the MOSFET that we have been, uh, you know, using and enjoying um, in the last couple of weeks in class and lab. So that's all for now.